the management. I'm going to tell you up front, if you don't have at least half an hour to 45 minutes to deal with a new tinnitus patients, don't see them. Time is very critical with tinnitus patients. For both of you, in fact, it's an investment in if you spend 45 minutes with your first visit with the tinnitus patients, that's actually going to reduce the number of future calls from this patient to your office. Keep that in mind. Now, an, an option for treatment that's very common if there is a hearing loss and you know that the tinnitus is uh, uh, matchable, uh, then a properly fitted hearing aid with or without even masker would be an, a good option. I'm, I'm sure most of you have uh, tried that. <clears throat> what is important, even before doing the hearing aid option, is to address the secondary symptoms. If you're not willing to do that, again, we're gonna go back into that vicious cycle, the disconnect between the patient and you. Poor sleep, very important, and anxiety, depression, and you need to team up with psychiatry, psychology when needed. I, because of my training, can use uh, some psychiatric medications like uh, anti-anxiety and SS, RI and the SNRI, and I know how to handle the side effects and interaction with other medications, what have you. It's very important. If, don't, if you don't want to get into this, then the psychiatry, psychiatrists, at least in the United States, are the ones that would do that, and psychology for the so-called cognitive brain therapy. Even though you can have the patient try the online groups, and uh, online uh, applications now that can help with tinnitus. Some of them actually have some good masking options, uh, tones and noise and, and what have you, before they go on and, and start investing in uh, uh, long-term psychological therapy, which is generally not covered by insurance. Um, uh, certainly, if there is an acoustic tumor, uh, surgery is important. If the patient is a candidate for surgery, I have uh, a lot of acoustic tumors that I've been watching for years. Uh, as long as they are intracanalicular and are not affecting the speech discrimination and also the uh, vestibular system that much, uh, Wait and watch now is a very good option with patients uh, with small acoustic tumors. The medication I use, melatonin, which is over-the-counter medication, is a sleep aid. And there is a couple of studies from Germany in, I think, in the 80s, 90s, where it showed about 60% improvement in tinnitus. That's good if you reduce the tinnitus even if you reduce it 20-30% and have the patient sleep better and practically no side effects, why not? It's good. And if you decide to use it, uh, I would use the 5 milligram. And you tell the patient up front, don't expect that it's going to work tomorrow, right? It's going to take a minimum of two to three months and don't make any changes before three months, and the patient should be willing to, to do that. Benzodiazepines, uh, the SSRIs, and again, you have to try them for a minimum of 10 to 12 weeks and then reevaluate. Medications that I don't use for tinnitus, like the NMDA or the GABA, and the results in the literature using these medications are uh, not really uh, consistent with uh, their use in, in tinnitus. Lifestyle changes. Um, even though there is no direct relationship for the sake of discussion between heavy smoking and heavy caffeine and tinnitus, I try to encourage patients to be moderate 
in smoking, preferably stop smoking. And I, um, a, a regular lifestyle, like the many years, uh, like the migraine patients. Uh, in other words, uh, exercise regularly, eat healthy, uh, go to bed more or less at the same time. It doesn't matter what time, but you have to go to bed at that same time, nine o'clock, 11 o'clock, one o'clock, but it is the regularity of the lifestyle. Music therapy, meditation, people can do this on their own. And as I said, there is a lot of um, applications on the uh, uh, internet. You can download them and you can use them. And then the social media support groups. I think that that, that is pretty good for these patients. Um, <clears throat> now, that, and, and that's obviously for the idiopathic subjective tinnitus. Now, if the tinnitus is due to migraine, many years, then you treat the migraine or you optimize the treatment of migraine and or many years. Just going to talk about uh, those two uh, disorders here. If it is an early tinnitus, an early Meniere's disease, they actually respond very well to the dexamethasone, 24 milligram. The migraine tinnitus, you control the disease, you change lifestyle, regularity is very important. The top of max, that's, uh, there is an A missing here, and if there is a significant low frequency hearing loss, I have done intratympanic perfusion in very selected cases. That is not the standard of practice. That's me, Mohammed Hamid, have done that. And in the selected patients, it worked uh, reasonably good. As a, a sample of my, my data, uh, significant number of injections. Uh, many years is much more evident in the female population. With the dexamethasone perfusion, it, it actually improves the vertigo and the hydroxyzins. And 60% tinnitus reduction, especially in the low frequency many years disease. Remember, many years can affect both the low frequency and the high frequency. Most likely it is the low frequency, especially in the early stage of the disease, and they respond very well to the treatment. I don't know how many people uh, in the audience do intratympanic perfusion. It is not something you stick a needle, inject the fluid, and go away. Uh, this needs to be done with the clear understanding that we have to maintain practically completely filled middle ear for half an hour patient lying down, and we have to use the dexamethasone. Methylprednisolone, which is also have been uh, reported in the literature, doesn't really cross the three of us collaterals. The study by Lauren uh, Pons from uh, Canada that popularized the use of methylprednisolone, it was interpreted incorrectly, and Lauren and I have settled that, that debate he will be also on one of the future webinars in, in, in our group here. Um, so here is an, just an example, uh, a patient presenting with significant low frequency loss and 40% um, uh, discrim injected, that's year 2000, follow up three years later, that's the year. Um, how often would you see that with any treatment other than infection panic perfusion? In my experience, you wouldn't see it. And it is beyond what we call the spontaneous recovery of uh, uh, many years uh, disease. Uh, that's the speech discrimination. It's a telltale. If your speech discrimination increases, it means that the stravascularis endolymphatic interface inflammation has actually subsided 
and the air is working much better, during which you would expect lower hydropic symptoms and tinnitus. And here is a speech discrimination again in pretreatment, uh, which is uh, this group with an average of 20, 30% going up to 60% average. In general, in a successful treatment, a 30% gain in the speech discrimination is always evident. Sometimes you get as much as 70. The range is, goes between zero and 60%. There is no other treatment, and that's a five years of follow-up. There's no other treatment uh, that will give us that increase in speech discrimination. Look at um, the tinnitus here. When we compare the tinnitus to natural history, placebo effect, you'll have a 60% of the patient saying, my tinnitus has dropped by at least 60% and their psychological impression of that tinnitus, you can tell, they, they smile, they want to stand up and give you a hug and, and so forth. They're really very happy with uh, the reduction in the tinnitus. So what is the take home message? Um, excuse me. Take home message is tinnitus is a significant disorder in our field, auditory vestibular medicine, otology, neurotology, often associated with hearing loss. There is a significant patient's physician disconnect. It's a complex pathophysiology and neuropsychology. And we do not have medical or surgical treatment for the spontaneous uh, idiopathic subjective tinnitus. There is some success in treating many years patients tinnitus and migraine tinnitus, but you cannot use those for the majority of patients who have subjective tinnitus. In other words, I wouldn't inject somebody presenting with subjective tinnitus without that definitive hearing loss or Meniere's disease. That sometimes is being done in some clinics worldwide. I don't think this is appropriate. The management focus for the time being is reducing tinnitus, subjective loudness, and secondary symptoms. Animal studies do not translate directly to humans. Funding needs to be increased to increase the research and translating research to human applications. All right, if you have questions and answer now, please text them on the Zoom chat. Uh, I would appreciate your feedback uh, <laughs> and how to change future <laughs> by emailing abmib11 at gmail.com. Please join and support the vision and mission of Auditory Vestibular Medicine International. This is probably going to be the seed for developing the global education. And finally, for prior recordings of the uh, webinars, uh, please email webinar at gebp egypt uh, com. Thank you. Thank yes. You. Thank you, doctor, so much for this lecture. Thanks a lot. First is a question in chat box, doctor. Any any questions? What is the chat thing? Uh, doctor, you can find chat icon uh, in the uh, okay. participants. Okay. Yeah. Why it isn't a pathology by itself, only symptom in spite of this large number of idiopathy? Uh, hang on. Where, where do I see that? More. Where is the chat? Um, okay, what's the question, uh, Dr. Rada? Please? Dr. Thursday, thank you for this great lecture. Uh, first is a question about red flags in tinnitus. About what, sorry? Red flags. 
when when uh, it is annoying are we we are annoyed about symptom of tinnitus in patient red flags yeah about what red flags in tinnitus when patient complain rise red flag we are annoyed about it not just subjective without <clears throat> underlying cause all right um i think what what needs to be done is to uh to try uh to have an idea uh, about the psychological and psychiatric impact uh, of the tinnitus. And then there is a red flag, obviously, when you have unilateral tinnitus and unilateral sense of neural hearing loss, then uh, that needs uh, to be followed up uh, with an MRI. That, that's, that's an easy red flag. Uh, the majority of patients with tinnitus, particularly the female population, would have a significant uh, uh, psychological impact, but they don't have deep-seated psychiatric manifestations, particularly talking about, the worst possible scenario is, and I have seen patients say, they're gonna commit suicide because of the tears. If it is from men, I would take that more seriously, and I'm not making any uh, sex differentiation here. This is what the data is. Uh, suicidal ideation most likely are followed up by male than female. If you're trained to deal with that, you have to ask directly and empathetically, and if you feel that there is a definite uh, concern. These patients, I send them to psychiatry. I don't deal with them uh, for their own benefit. Thank you, Doctor. Another question. Another question about platelet rich plasma injection. Rule of platelet rich plasma injection. Uh, uh, it, it has no scientific basis. It doesn't. Uh, apply to tinnitus. Second question about why it isn't a pathology by itself, only symptom in spite of this large number of idiopathic. Well, it's, it's not a pathology because we cannot really, other than seeing uh, eventually, if you want to get the temporal bones, uh, there will be a significant loss in the peripheral and central auditory neurons. Uh, but you cannot see that pathologically. You, there is no way you can get a slide and show that drop in uh, auditory in, in neurons. So it is a symptom. It's a complex symptom uh, because of the, again, the biopsychosocial uh, model. And it's idiopathic um, because you cannot assign a disease. So, but you have the tinnitus. Uh, hearing loss is, is part of it. Uh, Age-related hearing loss, um, you can call it, uh, if you will, the most uh, idi idiopathic phenomenon behind tears. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether this answered the question or not. It's a symptom complex primarily due to loss of hearing. Uh, majority of people with normal hearing will not experience tinnitus, even though sometimes, by the way, I have seen patients who have normal hearing. And by normal, I'm talking about zero to five dB, not the right ear at zero and the left ear at 20, and they're calling it normal, and as I'm sure you, you know about that. So um, some patients with normal hearing would have tinnitus, and uh, generally speaking, if you did hard into this, it's either drug-induced or noise-induced type hearing loss, or a trauma that perhaps have forgotten. People went to a, um, a party, sat next to a louder speaker for the sake of discussion, and forget about it, and then a week or two later, they're beginning to feel they have tinnitus, and the hearing test is normal. Uh, so 
that, that's the kind of uh, situation where I would say it's not associated with hearing loss. Thank you. Next question is in unilateral tinnitus, can ABR enough to outlet vestibular schwannoma or MRI is a must? Uh, we've gone through that for thousands of years. ABR is insensitive to detect uh, acoustic tumors, particularly smaller ones. And the MRI with contrast is the standard clinical test and legally as well, uh, at least in the United States here and in Europe as well. Unilateral sudden sensory neural hearing loss with tinnitus and an audiometry showing a significant asymmetry. MRI is the first uh, uh, and only, to be perfectly honest with you, audiometry and the MRI are the only two uh, evaluation modalities that we use. Uh, ABR, we all know its strength in uh, threshold determination in, in born and young children, but has no role otherwise, maybe in other free neuropathy, but we can talk about this another time. Okay, next question, Dr. Are there any trials for a specific intratympanic injection like lidocaine or glutamate receptor antagonist? When I was in England, uh, there was, uh, I can't remember his name, his first name was Peter. He uses lidocaine injection for tinnitus uh, the trouble with lidocaine is it caused a lot of vertigo because it go through the round window and the results were uh, not really clinically significant. So uh, at the moment, I, I'm not aware that that's being used. Uh, and I'm not aware even of any intratympanic uh, trials using uh, any uh, anesthetics per se. Other than, again, with many of his patients uh, use intratympanic dexamethasone. But I wouldn't use intratympanic perfusion in uh, just non many years tinnitus. Thank you so much, Doctor. No more questions. Very well, thank you all. Uh, and as I said, if you have any cases or what have you, feel free to call the group, join the group. Um, it's, the group is increasing in number and we plan in quite a bit of educational activities, particularly the residence forum actually, that is now uh, overseen by uh, Dr. Uh, Angela Regis from Portugal. She's doing a wonderful job. And I would like to encourage the uh, younger residents and the junior faculty to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate the time. Is they asking Take about care. name of group, doctor? About? Name of group. About neuro? Na name of the group. Oh, the, the, group. Uh, the, the, the group is, there it is. Uh, I uh, will give it to you here. You can take that. It's called uh, Allergy Vestibular Medicine International Board, AVMIB. If you go and uh, put that into the Facebook uh, inquiry, you will get to the group. And the group is primarily focused on physicians and scientists, okay? Uh, we're not including uh, then the psychologists, if they wish to be part of it, fine. Um, I don't think we have many psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are kind of, they see the dizzy patients, give them the medications, and then send them to the primary care physicians. Uh, but primarily the group is uh, EMT, neurology, otology, neurotology, audio vestibular medicine, and uh, scientists, primarily the PhD scientists working in the area of auditory and vestibular medicine. I put your so LF group in chat box. I'm sorry? I put the URL of the group in chat box. All right. Audience yeah. can join it now.
Any other uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and and by the way, the next uh, the fourteenth. Uh, let me make this announcement. The fourteenth, we're starting uh, a couple of webinars on audio vestibular medicine testing. On the fourteenth, uh, Professor Berg from Maastricht, Holland, and uh, Professor Manzari from uh, Southern Italy. Uh, and I will uh, get the first uh, part. Uh, and we're going to focus on uh, ENG uh, pitfalls and DOG, obviously, and uh, them. And VHIT, Dr. Manzari is going to focus on them. And VHIT, and uh, Dr. Bird is going to talk about the ENG. And I will also be uh, presenting some information about the variability of the ENG and how we deal with it uh, in, a, in a critical uh, setting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So much. Uh, Dr. Rada, Dr. Rada, I think, has the link to that uh, webinar. Uh, and it will be on the Audio Vestibular Medicine International Board uh, page as well. Okay. All right? Okay. Thank you. Have a nice uh, Monday afternoon. Oh, it's Tuesday. Sorry, <laughs> Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. And look forward to seeing you all again. Please send me your feedback. Tell me, don't tell me it was wonderful. I want to know what is missing and what is it you don't like. Don't worry about it. I'm I'm not going to take it personally. Send me the feedback. All right. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. How do I exit now? I'm in. You're the, gonna. You're I'm gonna. You're gonna exit me. All right. Kick me out. <laughs> bye bye. We are all out. Bye bye. <laughs>